few months ago, Lincoln hosted a Global Issues Network conference. During this conference, participants gathered and talked about many global issues. In one activity in particular, they were asked to split up into groups and discuss solutions to some of these problems. Later, some of these solutions were read out, and one of them in particular scared me. One of the groups decided that as a solution to climate change and carbon emissions, they would recycle more. Here's the problem, though. Recycling has nothing to do with fixing climate change. One could argue that recycling lowers industrial production, which does contribute to climate change, but if you're a very small percentage, and I could just as easily counter-argue that recycling actually contributes directly to climate change, considering that recycling plants and recycling trucks emit greenhouse gases. But why does this scare me? To me, climate change is one of the biggest problems that we're currently facing and will continue to face in the coming years. And we can't expect to solve it if there's misconceptions like this about the nature of the problem. If anyone were to understand the nature of climate change, it really should be the people flying across the world to a gin conference to discuss it. If those people don't, then it's likely that most ordinary people don't either. This is why I'm here today. I'm someone who does understand climate change, and I believe it is my responsibility to educate and inform people about it, and to make sure I can minimize the amount of misconceptions about it. Let's get started then. The first thing we need to understand is what is called the greenhouse effect. For now, I'm only going to talk about completely natural phenomena without considering human interference. The first concept related to the greenhouse effect that we need to understand is that everything radiates energy. All those chairs are radiating energy. That computer over there too. In fact, everything and everyone in this room is radiating energy. So is the sun. I'm sure we've all looked at the sun at least a few times in our lives, and it's pretty clear that it's giving off energy. I mean, we can't even look at it without burning our eyes. The question is, why can we so clearly see the light coming from the sun, but if we look at, say, our hands, there doesn't really seem to be any energy coming off of them? The, an the answer to this question is very simple. Hotter things radiate energy at smaller wavelengths, while colder things radiate energy at longer wavelengths. If we look at this spectrum here, our eyes can really only see light in this range here, the visible range. Light in all the other wavelength ranges are undetectable to us. If you consider heat vision goggles, like in the movies, they're really just goggles that detect light in the infrared range and allow us to see it. This is also how different colors work. Different colors are just different wavelengths. The wavelength of red light is approximately 650 nanometers, while the wavelength of blue light is approximately 475 nanometers. So what does any of this have to do with the greenhouse effect? Well, now that we understand that both the Earth, that everything radiates energy, then we can say that both the Earth and the Sun are radiating energy. Now, some of this energy being radiated from the Sun comes towards the Earth and warms it. Then, the Earth emits its own energy outwards and cools it down. This energy coming in and this energy coming out are equal to each other, and this keeps the Earth at a stable temperature. However, we know that the sun is much hotter than the Earth, so we can say that this energy coming in is at a smaller wavelength, and the energy going out is at a longer wavelength. We can say that the energy coming from the sun is in both the visible and in the ultraviolet range, while the energy going out is in the infrared range. Now, there are several gases in our atmosphere that are going to influence this process. These gases are what we call greenhouse gases. By definition, a greenhouse gas is a gas that allows ultraviolet light to pass straight through it, but when the infrared radiation reaches it, it absorbs it and retransmits it in all directions. Some of this retransmitted energy comes straight back towards the Earth and warms it. This disrupts the balance, the balance established by the energy coming in and the energy going out. However, this process is completely natural. There have always been natural levels of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that help keep the Earth at a livable temperature for us. Without these gases, the Earth would simply become too cold and we would all die. Why then? Is there so much debate and controversy on this topic? The answer to that question is the fact that the concentration of some of these gases has been skyrocketing. One of these gases is, car is carbon dioxide. Here's a graph of the CO2 emissions in our atmosphere since the 1700s. On the vertical axis, you see the CO2 concentration in parts per million. And on the horizontal axis, you see the time in years. If we look at around the 1750s and onwards, the, the level of CO2 is constantly increasing, and the rate of increase is also increasing. If we consider the historical time period of the 1750s, we know that it's when the Industrial Revolution first began. Now, when the Industrial Revolution first began, it was when we really started to burn fossil fuels and natural gas in order to create energy. And when we burn fossil fuels and natural gas, we emit greenhouse gases, especially CO2. This next graph is from the last 800,000 years. If we look at it, the levels appear to always be going up and down. But at the very end, in the top right, we can see what appears to be a glitch a random, arbitrary vertical line. But no, that's just how insane our CO2 concentration is right now. 
There's a lot of debate and argument around these graphs and a lot of different viewpoints. I'll try to explain the arguments from people who believe that climate change is, isn't actually happening or that it's not man-made. Something that people love to bring up is that right now, the CO2 levels could actually be going down. Here's our next graph. It's from the last year. If we look at this region here and here, the CO2 levels aren't going up in the insane rate we just mentioned. In fact, they're going down. So what does this mean? Problem solved? Can we all just go home? No. This is accounted for by the seasons. If we consider the northern hemisphere of the Earth, then we can say that most of the Earth's landmass is in this northern hemisphere. Now, when the northern hemisphere is in winter, there's less photosynthetic activity on average around the planet, meaning there's less CO2 emissions from plants. This is what accounts for these two downward slopes. But when the summer comes back around, so do the CO2 levels. This accounts for the yearly up and down fluctuations. But if we look at, at a longer time frame like we just did before, then it's clear that on average it's still going up. Another argument that people like to use is, that, is whether or not the CO2 levels are actually causing the increased temperature levels that we see. This graph is taken from Al Gore's famous speech, An Inconvenient Truth. It's a graph of the CO2 levels in our atmosphere and the temperature levels in our atmosphere. When we look at it, the two things appear to go almost perfectly together. However, does this mean that one is causing the other? Here, we have to get into the difference between correlation and causation. Just because two things go well together, that doesn't mean that one is causing the other. An example of this that my physics teacher loves to use is gray hair amount versus running speed. If you were to measure the amount of gray hair that a person has, and measure the amount of time that same person takes to run a certain distance, and plot the data together, it would go very well together. However, does this mean that gray hair makes you run slower? If I dye my hair back to blonde, will I go back to running quickly? No, it just means that as you grow older, you get more gray hair, and as you grow older, you also run slower. Applying this concept to, to climate change, it would imply that there's a third factor changing, and as it's changing, it changes both the CO2 levels and the temperature levels. The next question that we need to answer is whether or not a temperature increase of a few degrees is actually a big deal, and if so, why? In order for us to, to answer this question, we need to consider the consequences of this temperature increase. The first consequence relates to snow, ice, and water. If, if there's a temperature increase, then we can think about that more snow and ice will melt and become water. And we know that snow and ice are, on average, more reflective than water is, and so water is more absorptive. So if on the surface of our planet, more snow and ice become water, then obviously we have more water and less snow and ice. So we have less, less reflective material and more absorptive material. So the surface itself becomes more absorptive and less reflective, meaning that it'll absorb more of the energy coming in and warm the planet even further, enhancing the already enhanced greenhouse effect. This increase in temperature will also cause the rate of evaporation of ocean water to increase, and the ability of our atmosphere to hold water vapor to increase. Now, since water vapor is a greenhouse gas, this will enhance the already enhanced greenhouse effect. Regions in our planet with frozen subsoils called tundras will be warmed. And when they're warmed, they, release, they will release CO2, causing what? You guessed it, an already enhanced greenhouse effect to become even more enhanced. So all these things together contribute to what we call the positive feedback effect. The positive feedback effect is what some may call a vicious cycle. What at first is a small temperature increase causes all the things we just outlined to happen, which causes another temperature increase, which makes these things happen even more, which causes another temperature increase, so forth, until we have a runaway greenhouse effect that destroys the livable conditions on the planet. An example of this is the planet Venus. It is thought that Venus used to have a liquid ocean of water, but as the sun's intensity began to increase, it started to evaporate and increase the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. This, coupled with the continued in increase in intensity of the sun, created a runaway greenhouse effect. And the end result was that Venus's ocean completely boiled away. Venus is now a desolate and uninhabitable planet, riddled with harsh and unforgiving conditions. This may very well be the future of our planet, once so beautiful and teeming with life, if we don't take any measures to prevent this enhanced greenhouse effect. So what exactly can we as citizens do to help alleviate this problem? The first thing you can do is to just be aware of it. You can check that off your list now. You're welcome. In terms of actually lowering the amount of greenhouse gases that we contribute to the atmosphere, there's a lot you can do. The first thing relates to motorized transport. The two motorized transport that we most use in our lives are airplanes and cars. Airplanes emit a huge amount of CO2, and especially since this is an international school, most of our carbon footprint is made up by airplane rides. 
So the first thing you can do is to just not travel by plane if possible. In terms of cars, most of us take car rides to school or to work every day. Now me, I make an effort to bike to school every single day that I can. Now that's two less car rides for every day that I bike for an entire school year, which we all know can be very long. <laughs> if, we live, if you live with, within biking distance of your school, there's no reason to not be biking. If you don't, there's still things you can do. A great idea is to just carpool. If two people share a car, then that effectively halves the amount of greenhouse gases that they would have, com they would, they would have emitted together, since they're only using one car instead of two. The second thing you can do is to just use less energy in general. We don't really think about where our energy comes from, but sadly, most of it is made up, is made up by burning fossil fuels and natural gas, which emit greenhouse gases. So by doing something as simple as turning off the lights when you're not in the room, you can actually lower our energy consumption rates, which in turn will lower our energy production rates, and lower the amount of fossil fuel and natural gases that we're burning. So it'll lower our carbon footprint by just using less energy. The third thing you can do relates to your diet. The amount of meat that you eat is closely related to, to your carbon footprint. If you think about the meat industry, the more meat that we, that we eat, then the more meat they need to produce, and thus the more livestock they need. Now, livestock emit a lot of methane, which is a greenhouse gas. And I don't think I need to go into detail into how cows emit methane. I think you guys get the picture. <laughs> Anyways, the more meat that you eat, the more meat that needs to be produced, the more livestock the meat industry needs, and the more carbon, car carbon and now then, sorry, methane that are, is emitted into the atmosphere. So if you eat less meat, you'll be lowering your carbon footprint. If you do all three of these things together, you'll be making a significant contribution towards lowering our overall carbon footprint. Okay, now that I've talked your ears off, I hope you've all learned something very important about the nature of climate change and what we can do about it. Hopefully, you now understand that the greenhouse effect is natural, but that we're enhancing it. Hopefully, you now understand that this is most likely caused by the large amounts of CO2 gas, CO2 and, and other greenhouse gases that we're emitting into the atmosphere. Hopefully, you now understand that if you use less motorized transport, use less energy, and eat less meat, you can make a very significant contribution towards lowering our carbon footprint. I encourage you to not only be learners, but also teachers in this topic. The only way we can fix it it's not only be curious and inquiring it, but also, to also, but also to make sure as many people as possible are aware of the actual problem. Thank you for listening, and have a safe bike ride home.